episode of the Sword and the Spirit. I want to read to you uh, this evening from Psalm 25 as an encouragement. It's the first few verses, which is 1 to 5. Psalm 25 then says this, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. For thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. That's Psalm 25 verse 1 through 5. And what we've said from the outset for, for this programme as we continue on looking into the essential truths of the Christian faith by uh, R.C. Sproul of Ligonier Ministries. We want uh, this to be a springboard to study. And, and in, this, in these few verses we read, uh, Show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. This is what we want, we want the Lord to teach us his paths. We want him to lead us in his truth and teach us. For thou art the God of my salvation, on thee do I wait all the day. So what we're doing here uh, is we're looking into these brief, concise uh, teachings uh, on the doctrines of God, hoping that these will these will kind of push us into a, a greater in-depth study into the truths of the Scriptures. And, and, and in this, we, we're asking God to, to lead us in this, because without the Lord uh, unveil our eyes without him give us illumination in the scriptures then we're just going to be reading things and we're not going to be understanding them so let's have a, a brief recap from last week we looked into a special revelation and the bible so we're going to just read uh, as usual the summary from last week's chapter this is special revelation and the bible so the summary says this number one Inspiration is the process whereby God breathed out his word. God, number two, is the ultimate source of the Bible. Number three, God is the ultimate superintendent of the Bible. And when we looked at the word superintendent, it means to be responsible for the management or arrangement of an activity or an organisation, to oversee something. So God is the ultimate overseer. God is the ultimate manager and arranger of the Bible. And lastly, number four, only the original manuscripts of the Bible were without error. So basically, we looked into the fact that the Word of God is true, it's inspired by God, it's God-breathed, and that God is the ultimate source of that God-breathing. And that when we look at the inspired writings of the men, Throughout history who wrote them, we know that their character and their, their personalities and, and, and their journey were, were written into the scriptures as it were. But God in his provision and in his perfectness allowed the, 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 that to happen, but also that the, the word continued to be absolutely inerrant, pure and true and authoritative for this day and this age for all time. The word has no error in it at all. And we can fully trust it as our sole rule of faith for life and practice in Christianity. And all things, in fact. There are, I've heard, many people who have used principles of the Bible even in a secular way. And have found them to be accurate and true. So if we want to go on to, to this week, we are on number five of this first part of Revelation, which is the law of God forward to going into this the law of God but firstly just before we do again uh, if you've missed any of these programs and you want to go back please go to our YouTube channel which is Jacksdale and Selston Community Church and on there you'll find the playlist which is of the same title of the book Essential Truths of the Christian Faith and you can catch up or continue on where you left off before please do subscribe to our channel and click the bell next to the subscribe button and you will be uh, notified of, of any new videos that we put on. So that being said, let's uh, press on to the law of God. God rules his universe 
by law. Nature itself operates under his provisional government. The so-called laws of nature merely describe God's normal way of ordering his universe. These laws are expressions of his sovereign will. God is not accountable to any laws outside of himself. If we just take that one sentence there, God is not accountable to any law outside of himself, then if we were to say that he was accountable to something outside of himself, then he would cease to be God. He is, as we, as we go on to read, um, only accountable to himself and the counsels of his will. So God is not accountable to any laws outside of himself. There are no independent cosmic rules that God is obligated to obey. Rather, God is a law unto himself. You know, when we, when we hear that, you know, we, we, we might think of somebody who, I don't know, may have been in trouble or something, or maybe, maybe a bit unruly, and we, and we might say, oh, this, this person is just a law unto themselves. Because basically what we're saying is they just do what they want to do. Now, we, what we are saying about God here is not that he's just kind of someone that, that doesn't care about anything and just, just stamps his foot and says, I will do what I will do. But God is a law unto himself in that every, every law and everything good comes out of him. There is no law that, that binds him. It's the law that comes from him. And so in that sense, he is a law unto himself. Everything right, everything good, everything holy, everything pure, everything perfect, everything spotless, everything blameless, all comes out of God himself. This simply means... That God acts according to his own moral character. What greater character is there to, to act by than God in his perfect moral character that he has? His own character is not only morally perfect, it is the ultimate standard of perfection. We don't get any higher than God. He is morally perfect and it is the ultimate standard of perfection. His actions are perfect because his nature is perfect and he always acts according to his nature. So his actions are perfect, but everything he does, in whatever way he acts, are perfect because his very nature is perfect and he always, always acts according to his nature. But let's just turn this around a little bit and think about our nature. When we look at our nature, we look at our nature and we know that our actions are not perfect because our nature is not perfect. We look at our nature and we know that we are sinners, that we are wicked in our heart. The word says, doesn't it, in Jeremiah 17 verse 9, that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? It's, 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 I think it says in, in the King James that it's, it's wicked above all things. Who can know it? So when we look at our own selves, that, that our actions as sinners, they are imperfect because our nature is imperfect and then it says here that God always acts according to his nature and th again the truth is really before uh, God intervenes before God draws us to himself before his work uh, is carried out in our hearts and we become new creatures by the power of the Holy Spirit then our nature always acts or should I say we always act according to that nature we there is no way just as much as God can only act according to his perfect nature by ourselves, we can only act according to our sinful nature. And that is really uh, a very important thing that we must understand when it comes to salvation being a full work of God. Because we cannot choose any other than to follow our corrupt and sinful nature by ourselves. Going on then, it says, God is therefore never arbitrary. God is therefore never arbitrary, whimsical or capricious. He always does what is right. I wish that uh, I could say that about myself, and I'm sure that you wish you could say that about yourself. But the truth is, dear friends, that we don't always do what is right. Uh, we are untrustworthy. And even though God, by his grace, just changes from one degree of glory to another, and we do become more holy, and our lives become more sanctified, we are still human, and we, are, we do still sin, and we still do... Uh, show our untrustworthiness at times and God 
always, always, always does what is right. Even if sometimes in our own minds we don't understand what it is that he's doing. Because he does things that are way higher than our own thoughts and our own ways that we would think about doing them. There are three words here that I just wanted to uh, bring out. Again, not because we might not know what they mean, but there may be some that don't. Maybe some have an idea, but not quite sure. Uh, I myself find it very helpful anyway to look into these words, just to give myself a greater understanding. So the first one that we read here is the word arbitrary. Now, what does the word arbit arbitrary mean? I mean, it's, it's a bit of a, a mouthful to say, never mind understand, but it actually, it actually means unrestrained, despotic, or a despot, or tyrannical, so being uh, a tyrant, basically. So what it's saying, that God, God is never unrestrained, because in his perfection, he restrains himself. We know that God doesn't deal out punishment um, straight away to people that deserve punishment. He is actually long-suffering and slow to anger and slow to action in those areas. He is long-suffering. So he isn't arbitrary, so he isn't unrestrained, he's not a despot, he's not despotic he is not tyrannical he is not a tyrant and there are many people in this world who don't know god that would say that they believe god is a tyrant but he is not a tyrant the next word then is the word whimsical whimsical basically means fanciful or playful with i suppose it's a bit of a hairy fairy kind of lackadaisical attitude maybe but he isn't whimsical, he's not arbitrary. And the last one is capricious. Now the word capricious means given to sudden and unaccountable changes of mood or behaviour. So again, we can be all of these things. We can be arbitrary, we can be whimsical, and we certainly can be capricious. We can be given to sudden, unaccountable changes of mood and behaviour. That's the way we are. But God is never any of these three things. So it says again, I'll just read. God is therefore never arbitrary, whimsical or capricious. He always does what is right. As God's creatures, we are also required to do what is right. God demands that we live according to his moral law, which he has revealed to us in the Bible. Keep these words in your, in your heart, in your ears, which he has revealed to us in the Bible. Again, showing us just how important this great word of God is. God's law is the ultimate standard of righteousness and the supreme norm for judging right and wrong. As our sovereign, God has the authority to impose obligations on us, to command our obedience and to bind our conscience. He also has the power and right to punish disobedience when we violate his law. Sin may be defined as disobedience to God's law. This is another paragraph here that really many people may struggle with when it says God has the authority to impose obligations on us. He's, he has the right to command our obedience and to bind our conscience, the power and the right to punish disobedience to his law when we violate it. Many people in the world would look at that and say that that's God being a tyrant. But it, but it isn't. God is our creator. And the fact that, that I'm sitting here this evening and, and you're sitting where you are and you're taking in the breath, the oxygen of the air, and we breathe and we might take a drink of water, we might be taking our supper, all those kind of things. But the reality is, dear friends, that, that he holds our breath in his hands. And, and I, it makes me think, you know, if he closed his hand or if he just blew it away, you know, our lives would end. The very, very truth and the very fact and the depth of the reality that, that we're alive now because God is allowing it to be so. That we don't live just because our heart beats and because our brain works. We live because God allows us to live. Uh, and we, we were preaching in the open air this morning. And one of the things that I was trying to get across to the people was that we can have this real, um, what would we term it, this kind of hope if you like this kind of assumption that's probably a better word this assumption that we have tomorrow 
that we're just going to wake up, that we're just going to go on tomorrow like we have today, that we're just going to get up and have breakfast and, uh, you know, the food will be in the fridge, the, the air will be clean, the, our job will be waiting for us, the bills will be paid. We just, we have this assumption that we're just going to wake up tomorrow. But the reality is that we don't have that, we don't have, or well, shouldn't have that assumption. We should be saying, as James says, that if it be God's will, we will be doing this or that thing. But the world, the people in the world, those who, who, who don't believe, really live on borrowed time and really live on assumption that they have tomorrow. And not only that, but they really throw and fly in the face of God, that he, in fact, is the one that holds their life in their hands. So he does have the right. He does have the right to impose obligations on us. He does have the right to command our obedience. He does have the right to bind our conscience. And he certainly has the right and the power to punish our disobedience when we violate his law. Some laws in the Bible are directly based on the character of God. These laws reflect the permanent transcultural elements of relationships, both divine and human. Other laws were intended for temporary conditions of society. This means that some laws are absolute and eternal, while others may be annulled by God for historical reasons, such as the dietary and ceremonial laws of Israel. Only God himself may set aside such laws. Human beings never have the authority to set aside God's law. I just want to turn to uh, the Gospel of Mark for a second, and we're going to look at Mark chapter 7. We're just going to read a few verses of what R.C. Sproul has just said to us. So Mark chapter 7. Verse 14 says this. When he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defile the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. And he goes on. The point here that Jesus is making is that the Pharisees were very adamant about cleaning the cups and the forks and the plates and making sure that they purified hands and that they were keeping this tradition that if they ate without cleaning them that they were breaking some kind of ceremonial law. But Jesus is saying, look, look, look. What goes into you from a plate or, or, or some kind of a food or, or something that you believe to be unclean? These were all types in the Old Testament to show us about what we, what we take into ourselves, around us. But he's saying when it comes to food or, or whether you use a cup that has been washed or hands have been... It's not what goes into you that defiles you. For that only goes into the, into the, into the tracks of the stomach and it burns up and the energy is used. And as it said, it goes out in the draft or in the waste. But what he says is, it's what comes out of the heart that defiles a man. Because all the perverse thoughts and action, well, the thoughts first and then the action, they, they come out, they proceed from within the heart. And that is what R.C. Sproul is writing here when it comes to the ceremonial laws. Those things uh, were kind of done with through Jesus Christ. And that's what R.C. Sproul is referring to when he talks about some that were temporary and and cultural and ceremonial while others were uh, eternal and he goes on to say that only God himself may set aside such laws we can't set them aside ourselves human beings never have the authority to set aside God's law so whatever we believe about the law of God and even when it comes down to what we what we eat and drink and when we look at what the the Israelites in the Old Testament were forbidden to eat and drink those things were unclean to them then but Jesus has declared all things clean. But we must get that from the scriptures, not just because it's our own opinion and what we think today is. We must, of course, never 
trying to um, cast aside any law of God that the scripture doesn't allow us to do. Moving on then, it says, we are not autonomous. That is, we may not live according to our own law. The moral condition of humankind is that of heteronomy. We live under the law of another. The specific form of heteronomy under which we live is theonomy, or the law of God. Okay, so that's the end of the chapter, apart from the summary and the Bible passages for reflection. But at, at the end here, we've got a little diagram that R.C. Sproul has wrote to explain what he was just saying about these different words. So I'm just going to lift this up so you can see. And just here it says autonomy. Autonomy equals autonomos, or self-law. So that's what autonomy means. It means we, we are a law unto ourselves. We Auto is our, on your own. Uh, so autonomy. Autonomos, self-law. Heteronomy, heteronomos, means other law. And theonomy, theos, nomos, is God law. So R.C. Sproul says here, we're not, we're not autonomous. You know, we might think we are, but we're not autonomous. We're not self-governed. We're not autonomous. We don't have self-law. But what R.C. Sproul says here is the moral condition of humankind is that of heteronomy. So heteronomy, we see there, is that we live under the law of another. We live under the law of God. And he says that the specific form of that heteronomy, the specific form of that other law, is theonomy, which is the law of God. So I hope that helps you with understanding those three different types of law there and the fact that we do live under heteronomy and that heteronomy in specifics is theonomy which is that we live under God's law. So the summary then, number one, God rules the universe by law. Gravity is one example of God's law of nature. God's moral law is exhibited in the Ten Commandments. That's number one. Number two, God has the authority to impose obligations upon his creatures. Number three, God acts according to the law of his own character. Number four, God reveals his moral law to our conscience and in Scripture. It's important that that could be. Another study that you could go away and have a look into yourself. God reveals his moral law to our conscience. What is the conscience? How does it work? And obviously he says that it works to our conscience. The law is revealed to our conscience and in scripture. So how do those things work together? I encourage you to go away and have a look at some of these things. And if, if you do, and we'd love to hear from you and find out what you have discovered in scripture. Please let us know in the comments or send us an email which uh, you can see the email at the end of the video will pop up for you. And then lastly, number five, only God has the authority to do away with his laws. Amen. That is so true. Only God can do away with his laws. We have now five scriptures here. I'll read them out and they will come up on the screen for you. And then we're going to read a few of them. So we have Exodus 20, verse 1 through 17. That will be... Uh, the Ten Commandments there in Exodus 20. Psalm 115, verse 3. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Romans 7, 7 through 25. And Galatians 3, 23 through 29. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at Psalm 115 first. See what that says. Psalm 115, then verse 3 says this. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. What a great scripture that is. And that has uh, amazing ramifications for, for, for all the doctrines that we're going through here. That, that God is God in the heavens and he, he has done whatsoever he has pleased. There is nobody that, that orders God around. He will do that which he pleases to do. And there is nothing that can stop him. 
And so the next one we'll look at then, that was Psalm 115 verse 3. We'll go to uh, Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, I believe it was. So we're here just about going into the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. So 5, and we're looking at verse 17 through 20. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfil. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all shall be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So therefore, that Jesus Christ came not to just do away with the law, but actually to fulfil it. And that we ourselves fulfil the law of God through Christ. However, that doesn't mean that, uh, that we should be ignoring any of the Old Testament or the law of God, we should all the more desire to fulfil the moral law of God. The ceremonial laws uh, were a picture of what was to come, but the moral law is still very much there for us to uphold. So that is very, very important for us. The last scripture we're going to look at for today is Galatians. We'll go to the letter of Paul to the Galatians, which is just after Second Corinthians, just before Ephesians. So Galatians chapter 3, and we look at 23 through 29. We've got a couple of minutes. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptised into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And ye, if ye be Christ, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to to his promise. The law was given so that we that sin might be revealed to be what sin is, the sinfulness of sin, that we might know what sin is. I think Paul said in Romans 7, if it weren't for the law, I wouldn't have known that I was living in covetousness. And so it's a schoolmaster, not to save us, but to lead us to the one who does, which is Christ himself. I want to, uh, to give you thanks this evening for joining me. I do pray that this chapter has been beneficial to you as it has to me we go on next week to the prophets of God in number six the prophets of God and uh, I hope you can join us again next week I'd just like to finish in prayer before we before we leave father God we thank you in the name of Jesus for your word we thank you Lord God for the Bible we thank you that you've given it to us Lord that it teaches us that it guides us that it that it, that it leads us and Lord, that we can go to your word and in prayer and that, that we can be a people who, who know how to live because of your word. Father, we thank you for, for, this, for this study today. We thank you for the study on the law of God. We ask you that it might not just be a study law, but it would really cause us to press on into the word of God. That we would love the word of God. That, that, that as I was speaking to a friend today who said, if we love someone... We want to be getting to know them all the time and discovering who they are. And so, Lord, we must, if we love you, be in your word. So, Lord, help us, we pray, by your spirit. Give, give us a hunger and a desire after your word more than we've ever had. That we might come to know you, Father. We might come to know the Lord Jesus. That we might come to know your Holy Spirit. And that we might live in all those things that you prefer, prepared for us to do before the foundation of the world. Lord, we give you thanks. I ask a blessing upon all our viewers. Pray, Lord God, that you would really change them, provoke them in their hearts, Lord. Give them a great desire for you and your word and to live in this generation as lights set on a hill. Lord, that we might be seen by those around us to, like your disciples, that we have clearly been with the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask these things for your glory. 
In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. And we'll see you, God willing, next week. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.